Truth. It's absolute. It's not relative. It is concrete. It is a reality. It is of God. I think we all sense that because many of us enjoy the crime-fighting shows on TV and their quest for the truth. Guys like Jack and me, we remember back to the 60s with Perry Mason, Sherlock Holmes, and Charlie Chan. Right, Jack? Of course, today there's Law and Order, Criminal Minds, and CSI, Las Vegas, New York, Miami. I don't know why they don't have anything going on here in L.A. But one of the most provocative scenes comes from a film in its quest for truth. It's a 1992 movie, A Few Good Men. It's a military court-martial. It's a high-level conspiracy cover-up. And Colonel Jessup is played by none other than Jack Nicholson. He's on the stand. He's being questioned by the young Lieutenant Caffey, Tom Cruise. And the tension mounts. And defensively, Colonel Jessup says, you want answers? And of course, Caffey comes back, I want the truth. And then Jessup says, you can't handle the truth. You know, for a lot of people, that's why they don't come to church. But you're here, and I believe you want to handle the truth. The title of our lesson today is Digging for the Truth. We're going to be in the book of Ezekiel. A quick history review so that we're all familiar with the text. We remember that the glory years of Israel were in about 1,000 B.C., under the kingship of David and Solomon. Then about 900 B.C., Israel splits into the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. Well, Israel quickly departs through a series of evil kings, and by 722 B.C., is led into captivity by the Assyrians. Judah's digression from the truth is a little bit slower. As a matter of fact, there are a few heroes that come on the scene. One of them was King Josiah, whose reign was from 641 to 609 B.C. But after his reign, then Judah goes downhill into wickedness. After Josiah reigns, his son Jehoahaz reigns for three months, and then the Pharaoh of Egypt takes him away in chains. Then, Josiah has another son called Jehoiakim, who's very evil. He, he reigns for 11 years. Then his son, Jehoiachin, reigns just for three months, and he's taken into captivity in the Babylon. Now, he's very important because it's through him that the lineage of Jesus continues. Also, it's where the book of Ezekiel is going to pick up. And finally, the last king... Of Judah is King Zedekiah, another son of Josiah. He reigns for 11 years, and then at the end of his reign, that is when the temple is destroyed and all of Jerusalem is decimated. The date is 586 BC. Now, why do people get confused? Well, basically, there are three times of exile. The first is in the third year of Jehoiakim. That would be dating 606 A.D. We know about that one because that's how the book of Daniel starts out. Daniel was in that exile, okay? Now, that's the date that Jeremiah takes through the prophecy of God. And 70 years later, Cyrus comes to the throne in 536 B.C. And so that's when the exiles are sent back to Jerusalem, amen? So that's important. The second exile is under Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin himself, after three months of ruling, is taken away to Babylon in about 597 B.C. It's in that number that most likely Ezekiel is taken as well. And then, of course, the final exile is in 586 B.C. when everything is totally decimated. The temple is burned. The walls are burned. And, of course, we know the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah pick up on that. And so, let's turn to the book of Ezekiel. We read in verse 2 of chapter 1. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. Okay, so now we know the date right here. It's about 592 B.C. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. Okay, so 
Ezekiel prophesies in Babylon. There the hand of the Lord was on him. Okay, now let's jump to our text in Ezekiel chapter 8. Now that we have a time marker here. Beginning in verse 1. In the sixth year, in the sixth month on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign Lord came upon me there. Wow, this is a lot right there. So it's the sixth year, so now the date is 591 B.C. We know that the destruction of Jerusalem is imminent. It's close at hand. And yet still God is trying to work with his people. And so the Bible says right here in Babylon, Ezekiel has come to his house, the elders of Judah, who most likely were taken in that exile at the same time Jehoiachin was taken. They're sitting before him, so he's going to give them, quote, the prophecy of God, the word of God. And the Bible says this time, the hand of the sovereign Lord came upon me. Now the other text just says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. This time it's, uh, you know, it translated actually be like, it mightily came upon me. Like something mega is going to be said right here. Amen? Verse 2. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appearance to be his waist down, he was like fire. And from his waist up, his appearance was as bright as a glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, the visions of God. He took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance to the north gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen on the plain. Wow, is this an intense vision or not? Now remember, he's sharing this with the elders that are in the room. So this is the teaching of the Word of God. And so the Bible says right here, he sees this figure who is the angel of God or the manifestation of God comes and is is fiery in his lower half representing the fire of God, the vengeance of God. And the brightness of the upper half represents his perfection and his purity. And the Bible says he sees a hand come and he grabs Ezekiel by the hair. Amen? It's a good thing he didn't come after you, Michael. (laughs) He grabs his eagle by the hair and he lifts him up between the heavens and the earth. And in this vision, he takes him on over, way over to Jerusalem. And the Bible says he sets him down at the entrance of the north gate. Of course, that's the way that he would approach Jerusalem. It's from the north, from Babylon. But he says when he, when he got there, there the idol that provokes jealousy stood. Wow, this is in the temple area. The Bible says the inner court. Remember our temple series, the outer court and the inner court. This was the inner court where the priests and Levites are at. And the Bible says that the idol that provoked jealousy stood there. Now, there are two schools of thought. One says it's the idol of Baal. And it could well be because God is a jealous, zealous God. The word zeal and the word jealous are the same exact word in the Hebrew. And we understand that perfectly well because God desires, so to speak, a marriage union with his people. So if you have ever had a boyfriend who was unfaithful to you or a girlfriend who was unfaithful or a husband who was unfaithful or a wife was unfaithful, you know the feelings of jealousy that come because we want our special one to be totally faithful to us. That's why God says, if you're going to follow me, If you're going to have a relationship with me, you must love me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. Nothing less is good enough. And very interestingly, and I'm sure everybody remembers the temple series and the valued little pamphlet that we got right here. If you remember outside the temple... On the east side stood the altar of God. But to the north of it, where the steps up to the altar were, was called the the bath. Remember the sea? And the sea stood on the 12 oxen. Well, what happened is they took the sea off that, quote to speak, purified the priests. And they put the idol on it. Not the idol of Baal, because of what the Hebrew says but the idol of Astra, the queen of the heaven, 
the queen of immorality. And it was set right where the sea stood that was for purification. And now the idol that provoked jealousy was by the very steps where the priests would go up and take the sacrifices up to the fire of God. And the Bible says, and this is interesting, verse 4. And there before me was the glory of God of Israel, as in the vision I'd seen a plain. Wow, this is incredible. Even though the idol of Astra is there in the inner courts, God's presence is still in the temple. I mean, God is so long-suffering, is he not? Verse 5. Then he said to me, Son of man, look towards the north. So I looked in the entrance to the north of the gate of the altar, and I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The utterly detestable things the house of Israel is doing here? Things that will drive me far from my sanctuary? But you will see things that are even more detestable. He says, you think this is bad what you see. You're going to see even worse things. Verse 7. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall, and I saw a doorway there. Wow. He sees this hole, and God says in the vision, okay, now dig your way in. He says, I want you to dig for the truth. I want you to dig to see where Israel is really at spiritually. Verse 8, verse 9. He said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they're doing. So I went in and looked. And I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things and detestable animals and all the idols of the house of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of the house of Israel and Jehazaniah, son of Shaphan, who was standing amongst them. Each had a censer in his hand and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. This is so intense. He goes in this place and he sees the walls covered with idolatrous paintings and creations. These are no less the Egyptian idols. And he sees before the walls the 70 elders. Now this group of 70 elders started way back with Moses. These were the men that were supposed to stand side by side with Moses to guard the people's hearts, to make sure they didn't fall into idolatry. And now they're leading the way to idolatry. That 70, over time and through tradition, becomes the Sanhedrin. The Bible says, and leading the 70 elders was Jehazna, son of Shaphan. Now, Shaphan was the guy under the great restoration of Josiah who found the book of the law and brought it to King Josiah and read it to him. And he says, now his son is leading all of the elders in their idolatry. And get this, each had a censer in his hand. Well, at, at first glance, that doesn't hit you. But remember, the elders aren't supposed to have censers. The priests are to have the censers. They're getting further and further away from the word of God. Amen? And then it says, a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. Well, it's kind of cool to think that in your dream, you can smell. Amen? But right here, the actual word is also translated in other uh, translations, thick, a thick cloud, a fragrant, thick cloud. Well, what's the idea? Well, incense was very, very expensive. And so what's being portrayed in the vision, these people are spending all they have on their idols. Oh, that they would do that for God. Amen, church? Verse 12. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness? Each at the shrine of their own idol. Each one of these guys had made their own decision to be idolatrous. They say, the Lord doesn't see us. The Lord's forsaken the land. Again, he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. This is, this is a very important verse right here. Says the Lord doesn't see us. You see, because so much of our sin takes place in the darkness and away from the light and people of the light, 
We somehow think because people don't see our sin that God doesn't see our sin. Let me tell you something. God sees everything. Then secondly, we see right here that it's a very interesting little phrase. The Lord doesn't see us. The Lord's forsaken land. They're bitter. They're looking at their situation. They're seeing all of these kings from Pharaoh Necho come after them to Nebuchadnezzar coming after them. It says, the Lord's forsaken us. That's where we're being defeated. They have no concept that their sin is why God is leaving them. Their bitterness has given them a wrong understanding of the hand of God. And their bitterness is, in fact, the pathway to idolatry. Verse 14. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there mourning for Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. Well, Tammuz is kind of like the Greek god uh, Apollos. And the whole idea right here is that he is kind of the, the, the god of life and death. And so they're mourning the fact that he has now gone down to the underworld for six months because now it's the summertime. In the spring came the waters that beautified the land, but now the harsh summer, when all the rivers dried up, the water was gone, often famine comes, and so to speak, the land dies. And so these women who are worshiping this God, they're, they're mourning him, but their worship includes not only lascivious acts, but lesbianism, it includes prostitution, not only the cutting of their hair, but literally the pulling out of their hair by the roots. This is, this is the kind of worship that was going on at that time. Verse 16. Then he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance to the temple, between the portico and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, they were bowing down to the sun in the east. Wow. Who are these 25? Well, it's simple. We know there are 24 divisions of priests. Why 25? The high priest was also in their number. So what's he see in the vision? Their backs are towards the temple. They've turned their backs on God. And they are worshiping the sun god of the Persians. Let's keep reading. Verse 17. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the house of Judah to do the detestable things they're doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence, continually provoke me languor? Look at them putting the branch to their nose, just like sticking up their nose, the insolence towards God. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ear, I will not listen to them. Their sin is so great, I'm no longer going to answer their prayers. I am leaving them. Well, we're digging for the truth, are we not? Can we handle the truth? What have we learned so far in this passage? Number one, God's jealousy is aroused when his people commit spiritual adultery. When you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you are being adulterous to God. He is hurt, he is jealous, and he is angry. Because the only way that he'll be in a relationship with you is when you give him your everything. Isn't that what we expect of our wives? Isn't that what we expect of our husbands? How much more should a perfect God expect that of his people? Number two, we now understand that God sees everything. There is no such thing as secret sin. Oh, granted, you may keep it secret from other people, but God knows your sin. Number three, this is very encouraging. God is patient. He's long-suffering. Even in the midst of these people worshiping this idol, there was still a dim presence of the glory of God in the temple. He wasn't going to give up on his people until they totally turned their backs on him. See, you got to understand, God is patient. But there comes a time when his patience wears out. 
And finally, can you handle the truth? The leaders of God's people lead. But the question is, do they lead to God and true doctrine or to idolatry and false doctrine? What kind of spiritual leadership are you following? You know, Jesus talks a lot about digging. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew 13, beginning of verse 44, are two of the shortest parables, I, I think, in all of the Gospels. They're about the kingdom. We read beginning in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and brought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he in one way sold everything he had, and he bought it. Well, right here we understand that the kingdom is the treasure, amen? And so our first point is dig for the treasure. It's kind of interesting in, this, in these two parables put side by side, the first individual is by accident stumbling upon the kingdom. The second guy is looking for the pearl at great price. He's, he's diligently going after it. He's really seeking it. And people come to God. They find the treasure, salvation, in both ways. Do they not? You know, for myself, I wasn't looking for the treasure. I already thought I had it. I already thought I was a Christian. I already thought I was saved. You know, it's very interesting. Today in America, there are three major false doctrines about salvation. Can you handle the truth? Number one, infant baptism saves you. This is practiced by millions of people, and they believe they are right with God. That's a false doctrine. Number two, praying Jesus in your heart, just saying a prayer that Jesus will come in your heart, and you will be saved. That's a false doctrine. And then number three, a good moral life will save you. Well, I'm better than most everybody else. So I must be right with God. That is a false doctrine. And you know, when I was first confronted with what it meant to be, become a true Christian, a true disciple, I was upset. I said, well, why? Well, turn over to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, Peter's actually preaching to thousands of people on the day of Pentecost. And he ends his sermon in verse 36. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard it, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, well, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, those who accept this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Would that have been an incredible day to be there? So we see thousands of people, thousands of people listening to, to Peter just 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus. And Peter and the apostles are standing firm with deep convictions. They preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is indeed the promised Messiah, and they end the sermon by saying, and you crucified him. All those thousands of people, each one of them crucified him. Why? Because the Bible teaches we've all sinned. Amen? And so if Peter were alive today, he could preach the same sermon. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, these people really believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and the Bible says they're cut to the heart. They said, well, what do we do? And Peter says, here's what you need to do. you got to repent. you got to turn away from the darkness of your sins, and you got to turn to Jesus and make him your Lord. you got to become a disciple. And then you got to be water baptized to have your sins forgiven to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says those who received this message were baptized. You know, when I first heard that message, because I thought I was already saved, I thought I had the treasure, I wasn't looking for it, 
you know, I was, I was upset. I, I actually got mad at the guy studying the Bible with me. But you know something? There was something inside of me. You know, when someone opens the Bible and they start showing you the scriptures, you go, uh-oh, maybe they're right. So for the next 24 hours, I dug into my Bible like I'd never done before that time. Spending hour and hour trying to study it out. What does the Bible teach about being right with God? How do you get that precious treasure of salvation? About 24 hours later, I was baptized into Christ and became a fired-up disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, it's kind of interesting. I got some good news back uh, this week from a, a brother that I've, I've come to love a lot. His name is James Haynes. And uh, James, before he became a Christian, had, had gotten into a, a lot of wickedness. And he'd lived down in, in Southern California, and he'd been involved in drug trafficking as well as pandering, you know, pimping prostitutes. And he fled the state, and he ended up in this city in Oregon called Portland. And uh, he, he worked at a collection agency, the same one that Michael Williamson did. And... Uh, at first, he wasn't feeling any need, but over time, he began to feel a greater and greater need for God. Well, his best friend was a deacon in a church, and this guy went to church every Sunday. But he also went to strip clubs with James. And when there was a particularly bad moment, James just started praying, says, God, you got to show me a church to go to. And his deacon friend, and I just talked to James yesterday about this, his deacon friend was standing right there. He says, no, nope, I know that's not the right way. He says, they, a lot of guys here in the company, they talk about this guy, Michael Williamson, who's always reading his Bible. And says, I, that's who I've got to go talk to. So he immediately goes over to Michael and he says, Michael, do you know a place that I can go to church? And then James said, uh, just yesterday, he says, Michael started following around. Well, well yeah, yeah, I'd like to invite you out to my church. You see, Michael hadn't invited James on out uh, to the church. See, we, we got to understand there are open people all around us. Amen, guys? Anyway, he came to the church, and uh, it was right at the time that Lane and I came to the Portland church. And James was baptized in October. He was our number eight baptism. And I'll never forget it. And we were laughing on the phone yesterday, remembering it. But whenever we have a baptism, if you're, if you're visiting with us, you'll see a couple uh, today. We always have a couple people share about them. And then we have the person themselves give their own testimony about why they want to be a Christian, why they want to be a disciple. Well, James got on up there, and, and he says, you know, just something came over me. I didn't want to just talk to people, but I wanted to sing. And so he steps up to the microphone and he starts singing this black spiritual. He starts, when I woke up this morning, I didn't have no doubt. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt at all. And he sings this over three times. The whole church is like this, you know. We'd never had a singing baptism before. And, and it was incredible. When he went down in the water and then when he came up, he was so fired up. And then two months later, his wife Jennifer became a disciple too. And now they're the right-hand couple in the Portland church. Is that pretty awesome? Well, in the midst of getting his life right, he says, you know something? I, I, I fled the law by going up here to Oregon, and I want to get my life totally right. You ever felt that even after you become a Christian? There's some things I got to get right. And so he's been writing the authorities down here in Southern California that he wanted to deal with these past charges. And so the time came this past week. He went down to San Diego, and before he went on in, he got with Larry and Christy Wilson, who, you know, lead our region down there in San Diego. And the three of them were praying. And I guess Christy was praying, and she says, Lord, please give James justice. And James stops and goes, no, 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 sis, I need mercy, not justice. And the lawyer had told James, says, James, he says, here's the thing. This is a tough sell. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying the judge will put you on probation, and you'll pay 
X thousands of dollars in fees. Well, I had written him a letter, and several other brothers and sisters had written letters about James's changes. The judge had read them all over and said, James, you have made such a profound change. There will be no probation, and all fees are waived. You are free to go. <laughs> Is that awesome or not? <laughs> See, this man had, had gotten into such wick in his life, he knew there was only one place to turn to find the treasure, the pearl of great price. And he, like everybody else who gets baptized, had to sell everything he had. That's where we get the term sold out disciple. Amen, guys? In order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Got to ask you a question. Are you willing to dig for the truth? Can you handle the truth? What if you find out you're lost? What if you find out from the scriptures you're not right with God? Are you going to keep digging for the truth like Ezekiel did in that vision? Or are you just going to turn your back to the temple as the priest did? Point two, dig deep for a foundation. Turn to Luke chapter 6. Here again, Jesus talks about digging. Verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I'll show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house, but couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice, like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation, the moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Wow. Building a house here is analogous to building our lives. And at first glance, you go, what stupid idiot would not build his house on the rock? Well, maybe you should ask the folks in Pacific Palisades whose houses are now falling over the cliff because of the rains that have come. I mean, it's happened here in Southern California. Expensive houses. And I think for a lot of us, we think, well, I want to build on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. And as Psalm 18 says, he is our rock. He is our salvation. But I think for a lot of Christians, they think it's kind of like a one-time decision, like, okay, I got baptized, I'm now built on the rock. No, 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 no. You have to build on the rock. You have to build on the rock. We understand that whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, the storms of life are going to come whether you're righteous or unrighteous. And the ultimate storm that you're going to face is your own death. Everybody's house will be tested by the torrents, by the storms of this life. Well, what are two aspects in a practical sense of building on the rock? Well, first we need to understand that you got to dig down deep. This is going to take some effort, guys. And the first area that takes effort is in your own personal devotional life, your quiet times. How about it? Are you really digging in the Word of God? You got a commentary out? You've asked a Christian some things to study if you're a younger Christian? Do you, are, you, are you really studying some things out that are going to change your character and change your life? Or are you just kind of just open the Bible and go, okay, what, what's, uh, let's see here. Shh. I mean, are you really digging down deep. How about it? In your prayer. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's just so hard to pray. Well, that's the point. It's a spiritual exercise. That's the point. It's a spiritual endeavor. No wonder it's hard. You got to dig down deep. You've got to take the time to make sure that you're strong with the Lord. Secondly, building on the rock also in the congregation here is to take the first principles classes. And the Bible teaches in Hebrews 5 and 6 that we need to have 
a base, a foundation of the elementary teachings, the first principles. And so this fall, in each one of the regions, we're going to have first principles for all those people who have not taken it before. Whether you place a membership, whether you've been restored, or whether you've been baptized, the first principles is going to be a weekly class, essentially from the beginning of September on Wednesdays, all the way to about the middle of November. We need to get that in our schedules. Amen, church? Well, why? Well, what kind of storms come? Well, the first kind of storm comes is persecution. The Bible says that everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. So you've got to ask yourself, okay, are my convictions strong enough for my walk with the Lord as well as my convictions about the Word of God? Because we understand that persecution is going to come from two areas, life and doctrine. People are going to attack your life, and people are going to attack your doctrine. Are you going to stand solid? Secondly, you're going to have a challenge about your priorities at different times in your life, at different stages of your life. Are you going to put God and his kingdom first? In other words, don't miss church. You know, one of the areas that's come to my attention that I think that some of us got to really look long and hard as far as building on the rock concerns our jobs. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially his immediate family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Can you handle the truth? Let me just be straightforward right here. We have singles in this congregation who are living, dare we say, in clumps of five, sixes, and sevens, and nines, and tens that haven't gotten jobs to support yourself. And you are setting yourself up to fall away. And the fact that you've not taken care of your financial needs, the Bible says right here, you are denying the faith. Christians are not derelictal when they come to paying their bills. You work hard, and you get the money that it takes to live an immodest lifestyle. Sadly, there are even some marrieds that have not taken and made the efforts, let alone in searching for jobs as well as praying for jobs, to get the jobs to pay the bills. Why is that? Well, it's a very interesting thing. This generation is, in my opinion, very spoiled when it comes to jobs because this generation's mindset is, I want to find a job that I really like doing. You know, no other generation has ever had that mindset. I mean, back in, when the Israelites were in Egypt, they didn't go, oh man, I, I just want to be a slave of a really great guy. <laughs> Even in the first century, the Christians were willing to do whatever it took. Even in the Industrial Revolution in the United States, the 1800s, I mean, people were digging coal in mines. There was no thought, do I like this? They did it to get money, to put food on the table, and to pay the bills. That's the kind of work ethic every disciple needs to have. And if you like your job, well, good for you. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Let's talk a little bit more about jobs here. In Colossians 3, verse 22. Slaves. Of course, that's employees, right? Verse 22. Slaves, employees. Obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Is that the attitude you have towards your boss? I mean, I treat my boss just like Jesus. Is that how you do it? Turn to Titus. Chapter 2. Why would we do that? Well, Titus shares it with us. Verse 9, chapter 2. Teach slaves. Teach employees. To be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teachings about God our Savior attractive. 
Is the way that you work for your employer so attractive that they're begging you they'll come to your church? That's what we try to do. We have employers that we need to be treating like Jesus Christ so that we make the gospel attractive and they'll come to church with us and become disciples. And just think, if they'd become a disciple, they'd be a lot better boss. Amen, guys? But you know, the, it's very interesting to me how we can just grumble and complain in our hearts about our job and our lot in life. And that's a very dangerous place to go. The hardship. I mean, isn't that what took those elders out there in Ezekiel chapter 8? The Lord's forsaken us. I think a lot of you feel like the Lord's forsaken you because you got the job you got. You know, it's kind of interesting. Tony Antelon and I were talking just a couple days ago, and Tony said I could share this. Tony said, you know something, bro? I hate my job. He says, I hate it. He says, and sadly, there's been anger, been building up. I've been talking back to my boss. And Tony's one of the most respected brothers here at the church. He's one of our shepherds. And we all got to get it out there, don't we? He says, you know what it is? I've been praying for another job, and I figured out why God's not going to give it to me. I'm not grateful for what I got. He says, bro, you got to help me to repent. (laughs) How about it? Are you grateful for your job? Do you treat your boss like Jesus? Does your work ethic... Wherever you work, even when your boss is not watching, it's as if he is watching and you're trying to win their favor. Why? For personal gain? No, not at all. So that you make the gospel attractive and they'll come to church and then become disciples. Amen, guys? To live that kind of life, you got to dig down deep. Are you with me right here, guys? You've got to have such a strong personal devotional life that you set your mind to be grateful you're going into work every day and you are a light at that work so people will come with you just like James Hain came with Michael Williamson. Our last point is we need to dig into people's hearts lovingly. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. In verse 5, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. Well, the Bible says right here that the purpose of man are deep waters. Not exactly digging in water, but delving into the deep parts of the heart. And it says a man of understanding draws them on out. You know, there are a lot of people that think that Their lives are only their responsibility. They get very defensive, and they'll they'll even go to the point and say, listen, my life is none of your business. Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Keep your finger there in Proverbs. Verse 12 of chapter 5. Paul says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Let me tell you something. If you're a brother in the Lord, your life is my business. Your life is my business. Say, how about people out in the world? Well, we want to, you know, win them to Christ and everything, but we already know where they stand. They're lost. They're lost. I want to be in your life so I can help you because we're often so deceived about where we're at spiritually. You say, well, what about that scripture where Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged? That's true. He does say that. But if you look very carefully at the passage in context, he says, judge not lest ye be judged. Why? Because you shouldn't have hypocritical judgment. And Jesus talks about the guy that's got this two by four hanging out of his eye. He's he's looking at the other guy. He goes, hey, I believe you have a speck in your eye. Shh. Because that's hypocritical. But then he says, take the two by four out of your eye, then get the speck in your brother's eye. You're still supposed to help out. Just got to deal with your life. You can't be a hypocrite. 
Your life is my business, and my life is your business. Why? Because we want to present each of us perfect for the Lord. Amen, guys? See, that's, a lot of people don't want to be in a church where there's discipling because they don't want to open up their lives. They love their lives the way they lead it. They want their autonomy. Yeah, and autonomous disciples are in autonomous churches, aren't they? If you want help, and we all need help to get to heaven, or let me tell you something, we're going to be way late. Then you've got to be willing to open up your life and be discipled. Amen? Let's get back to Proverbs right here. In verse 5, the purposes of man heart are deep waters. You know, you go down deep in the water, and it's kind of dark and murky down there, isn't it? I mean, currents are going by. There's some creatures down there, too. He says, but a man of understanding, he'll dig down deep or dive down deep. And then he draws them out and brings them to the surface. He brings them to the light. You know, Wednesday night, we had an incredible, incredible men's night out in the West region. And it was a great time. The brothers were all there. And, and, I, and I did a lesson that, that centered on the fact that, that we need to get more evangelistic. And I referred back to a scripture in 1 Corinthians 11. And there Paul talked about communion and what happens to people when they're not doing well spiritually? And he put them into three classes. He says, when people aren't doing well spiritually, they're either weak, they're sick, or they've fallen asleep. They're like dead in the church. And I said, these are the three reasons that we are not evangelistic. And, and I wanted to share and go into a little bit more than even I did on Wednesday night for the brothers, but particularly in the area of when we find someone that's sick spiritually. What does it mean to be sick spiritually? Turn again to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. I mean, when your dreams are coming true, you're flat fired up. Amen, guys? He says, but hope deferred makes the heart sick. Well, how do how do people act when they're sick? We know how it is around most houses. If the wife gets sick, the husband just says, hey, hon, tough it out. Tough it out, hon. Now, if the husband gets sick, oh, babe, can you bring some stuff on in? I'm really, I'm really hurting. I'm tired. I need, I need my medicine, please. What a bunch of wimps are out there. But... But when we get sick, we, we become unmotivated, do we not? We feel like getting out of bed requires everything we've got. We always just want some help. Here I am, serve me. That's what a sick person is like. Well, that's what a sick disciple is like. A sick disciple comes when his hope is deferred. When dreams don't come true. You know, this, this has happened in the church, I think, with many Christians in many different ways. Because there are certain things that we come into the kingdom with thinking, God is going to give me this. So, a lot of times Christians come into the kingdom and go, Man, I, I don't have a Christian boyfriend yet. I don't have a Christian girlfriend. And people are hitting me at work all the time. And they become sadder and sadder. And then their bitterness takes them out by going out with non-Christians. Wow. Happens even with people that have been around the kingdom a little bit longer. They go, oh man, I thought God promised me I would have a Christian husband. I thought God promised me I have a Christian wife. God! And what happens? The heart grows sick. They become bitter. Just like those elders, remember? Those 70 elders? God's forsaken me. He's not blessing me. 
Sadly, in the kingdom, we believe, God, I want to marry a man who's always going to be faithful to me. And we should always be faithful. But there are men that have strayed through pornography and even adultery. And this sometimes makes the wife's heart grow sick because, God, didn't you promise me a husband that was always be faithful? I mean, I thought that's the contract I signed. God, I thought we'd always have a job where I would live upper middle level, upper middle class. I can't imagine I get fired from my job, God. Laid off. I know it's a recession, but God, I'm a disciple. (laughs) Then we get into this feeling of, well, God, my parents aren't saved, and my mom died. And we go, I don't, I'm just tired, I'm sick, I can't handle this. And there's a temptation to quit. Or how about this one? My children have never become Christians. Or they became Christians, they fell away. Wow, I understand that one. And you intuitively think, oh, it's absolutely promised. Well, it is promised that when, if you raise a child the way it should go, when he is old, he'll not depart from that time. But how about the in-between time? See, we have a lot of preconceived ideas in our Christianity that if they're not realized, our heart grows sick, it can cause us to get bitter and we can fall away. There's a lot of us that said, God, the world's going to be evangelized in our day. Our movement is so strong. And then when things collapsed, our faith collapsed because we thought it was just a given. No. God is sovereign over this world, but he's made every man and every woman with the right of free decision. And so God limits himself in all these areas. See, I mean, it's kind of sad. Even this, this week, Elaine and I got with a, a discipleship partner couple, and they'd gotten into some financial challenges. And the wife was, was angry, and she was very sad. Her heart was sick. And the brother had not been taking care of his family. But the wife's response to that was, well, then I just feel like falling away. I said, sister, you are absolutely in the wrong right here. Your husband has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. You are bitter, you are frustrated, and you need to repent. There is never an excuse to fall away. Are you with me here, guys? But that hope deferred has taken many a person out of the kingdom, out of the church. You know, a couple that uh, isn't here today, but I I, I love them a lot, is uh, Carlos and Lucy Mejia. And they've been Christians for a long time. And and they they realized their dream of going into full-time ministry. But when that came to an end and they were fired for no sin of their own. Their heart grew sick because their hope had been deferred. And they began to be frustrated. And they began to say, God, why have you forsaken me? And they began to get loose on the doctrine. They began to check out other churches. And they were sick. They were down. They were depressed. Well, then the Holy Spirit blew them on into Elena's My Life and several of you. And we started studying the Bible again. And they said, Wow. We have drifted a long ways from God. They start getting their doctrine right. They start getting their lives right. They placed membership. Of course, now they're our regional leaders in the north, amen? And come December 15th, their dream to be in the full-time ministry is going to become a reality again when they start leading the Washington, D.C. church. Is that awesome or not? Amen, church? See, I'm I'm here to tell you, dreams are awesome, and and every single person needs to have kingdom dreams. But there's no connection with your dream being fulfilled and being faithful to God. 
I mean, his dream would be in a full-time ministry. Maybe that's some of your guys' dream. And maybe you're sick because that hasn't become a reality. You need to repent. Why? Because what happens when your hope is deferred? Well, you start looking in other ways. What did these 70 elders start doing? They started to get into idolatry. Their hearts left God because God wants us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And they began to commit spiritual idolatry, and spiritual idolatry takes you out of the kingdom. And so there are a lot of things that we want in our lives and that are right to dream for. A great marriage, you should dream for that. Christian kids, you should dream for that. Baptizing your parents, you should dream for that. Full-time ministry, you should dream for that. Evangelizing the world in a generation, you should dream for that. But it has nothing to do with your salvation. Otherwise, you'll be like those elders who turned their back to the temple, became bitter, became frustrated, and fell into idolatry and spiritual adultery. And so today, it's pretty simple. Just one question I have for you. Can you handle the truth? Thank you. God bless.